this, Alan. Come on, you can do this. It's yours. Just show them what you can do. You got this. You got this. Okay, good. Oh, come, come on, come on in, come on in. Yeah. Mm. Hi, it's a, it's a, it's a real pl pl uh, pleasure to to meet you. Um, your name, please. Oh no, my name, my name is uh, Alan Al 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 Doucette. Uh, Mr. Douche, uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, I don't have lunch, but I'm just, tell me about yourself. Well, I got my degree from Dalhousie University. I feel I know, I, I, I have everything that you need to, to run your, to, I, I think I can, I, I think I, I can help. I don't care, I don't care about that. Just, just do a titration. No! Hi folks, today we're going to be talking about titrations and I'll just give you a little bit of history behind it just so you know where we're coming from. It'll set up the problems that we're dealing with later in this video. So the story goes that if you take a fire and burn it long enough, you're going to make ash. And the ash is actually considered a valuable resource, at least at the time in the 1700s, because what we're using the ash for was to extract potash. Why do we call it potash? Well, because the ash was sort of purified and processed using these large pots to burn it down. And yeah, they needed a lot of wood. So the wood was actually harvested from colonial America, cutting down acres upon acres. You'd actually get tons of this stuff to be able to produce a small amount of the potash. And then from there was a matter of shipping this potash across the ocean to Europe, where it would be used in a number of different ways. So for example, it's used to make soap. It was used in the textile industry as a bleaching system. And of course, yeah, think of the time it was used for gunpowder too. And so like every story, it pretty much comes down to money. Your goal as a potash salesman is to try to get as much money as you can for your product. And if you can throw in a little bit of, I don't know, salt, maybe swindle the system a little bit, why not? So this became a quite a big of a problem. How pure is the potash that we're sending? So they needed to do some type of chemical test to analyze the potash. And how would you do that? Well, this is a carbonate, and carbonates would react with an acid like vinegar, and well, you know what'll happen. Three, two, one. Whoa, it's coming out. Whoa. So in this video, we're going to be talking about titrations. And yeah, I know you should be in the lab doing these titrations, really get familiar with the process. But believe it or not, I've actually found a simple way for you to do this experiment at home. So just take a look here. Yeah, all you're doing is just turning this figure. We're trying to make a drop and just get it just right. Yeah, perfect. But seriously, titrations are a lot more than that. What it comes down to is the thought process, being able to relate the concentration, the molarity, the moles of one material to that of an unknown. And it's a process of problem solving that we really care about when it comes to learning titrations. We're gonna talk about the kind of regular titration that you might have already encountered, and then this other one, back titrations, that are, they're a little bit more complicated, but we'll work through it. All right, the direct titration first. So you're probably familiar with the apparatus, what you've got is some material that you know everything about and another material that you don't. So this is the titrant, this is gonna be the unknown. We have to have a chemical equation, a reaction that relates the two together. So T plus U makes, honestly, it doesn't matter what it makes, but it's some stuff. It does matter how these things are balanced. So the coefficients are going to matter. This will make sense with a real example. So as you see here, HCl reacts with NaOH to make some salt and some water. This reaction is pretty straightforward because everything's one to one. But you might have a system like this, the potassium carbonate that we just talked about reacting with acetic acid. This will make some potassium acetate, some CO2, there's the bubbles, and some water. Now it really wouldn't even matter that you made that. What did matter is that you've balanced this side of the reaction. So this is a one to two equation that we need to deal with. All right, let's do a practical problem of a direct titration. So the first thing you gotta do is read the problem. And here we see that we're doing a reaction between potash and some acetic acid. Now the other thing that I noticed with this titration is that there isn't even a reaction equation written down. But that's something we can figure out. 
because it's asking us to calculate the potassium carbonate as it reacts with acetic acid. So this is the reaction equation that we can work with. The second thing that we have to do is organize the information in the problem. By information, I'm actually just referring to numbers. So we notice the numbers here and they do have a place. I like to use the equation to organize the information. So I'll move things over like this. Now notice that I have the molarity and the volume for acetic acid written below the reaction. Whereas the 10.5 grams of potassium carbonate, I'm purposely putting it on the top of the equation. Now why is that? Because it's saying we have 10.5 grams of potash. Now potash is a source of potassium carbonate, but it's really not pure potassium carbonate. So I don't want to be misleading to say I have 10.5 grams of this. It's just I have 10.5 grams kind of related to it. So that's why it's hanging up on the top. All right, next steps from here. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate moles. So you can pull out the molecular weight of all of these compounds. And if you don't have that given to you, then you can just calculate it from the periodic table. So to calculate the number of moles, what I'm seeing is I'm recognizing that I have a volume and a molarity. Between these two numbers, I have all the information I need to calculate the number of moles of acetic acid. So you can see that the equation comes down to multiplying those two numbers. And yeah, since I've got mils, I'm going to convert that to liters as well. When you do that, the units will cancel out and I'll be left with 0 0.039 moles. So I'll write that number just underneath the acetic acid as well. All right, let's keep going. This is the key of every titration. We have to relate the moles of one substance to the moles of the unknown substance. And we do that through the stoichiometry in the equation. Now, if this were a one-to-one -one reaction, we know it'd be straightforward. The moles here would equal the moles over there, but it's one to two. So there's going to be a ratio 2 over 1, or is it 1 over 2? And, and I see it all the time, where it's almost like a 50-50 guess. So it's not a guess. There's logic behind it. So let me write out what the expression looks like. It's the number of moles of our acetic acid times 1 over 2 to give us the moles of potassium carbonate. So why did I pick 1 on 2? Well, it's because this is moles of acetic acid. I have to divide by moles of acetic acid to make that cancel out. So I have a 2 acetic acid to my one. This is not a guess. You do have to think about what that number is. It's a big mistake to flip that number up. So to finish this calculation, 0 0.01953 moles, and yeah, I might as well put it right where it belongs. Now let's stop and think. That's the moles of what? Moles of potash? No, it's the moles of potassium carbonate. So we have the molecular weight, we have the moles, from that we can calculate the mass, the number of grams. So that works out to be 2.7 grams approximately. And the problem's almost done until you go back and actually read what the question is asking, which was to say, what is the weight percent of potassium carbonate in the potash? In other words, what I'm relating is the mass of the pure potassium carbonate divided by the total mass of the potash that we have in our sample. That's where this number is finally going to come into our calculation. So we can express the weight percent as such, and because we're asking for a percentage, we'll multiply it by 100. It comes out to be 25.7%. Okay, let's rewind a little bit. We'll go back to this step where we were calculating the number of moles. It seems like we were strategically working on this side of the equation. We were taking the volume and the concentration to come up with moles. But what if we had just started over there? Like, that's a mass. I have the molecular weight. Why couldn't we calculate moles over here? Well, quite simply, because if you did, you would be wrong. 10.5 grams does not represent how much potassium carbonate we have in the sample. It's just how much ash we have. So we don't know how many moles we have. In a titration, only one side is known. The other side is the unknown. So it can only work in the order that we presented. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense, but please practice your problems. Uh, let's talk now about the back titration, and I'll admit this is, this is the harder one. It's got a lot more information going on in the problems. So back titration still looks like a regular titration, or more specifically, it looks like you're doing two titrations in one. So in a regular titration, we always titrate a standard with our unknown, but the goal is to always stop exactly at the endpoint where the two of them are equal. In a back titration, we are on purpose going to add more of our standard to the unknown. So this will be defined as being in excess. So for our example of titrating some acetic acid into our potash, what we would do is essentially dump all kinds of this acetic acid until this bubbles and froths and, and foams up 
but then we would purposely go further than that. In doing so, there would be more acetic acid left over and there'd be no potassium carbonate left over. Now the question becomes, how much of acetic acid is left? So with the acetic acid in excess, we're going to titrate that with a different base. So for example, NaOH, and we'll determine the number of moles of the acetic acid that are left over. So this is an example of a back titration. And uh, let's give you a second to read through it. So like before, the question comes down to organizing information. The first step of any titration is to come up with reactions. There aren't any given to us in this word problem, but the information is there to come up with a reaction. So let's just focus on the first line, the potash reacting with acetic acid. Of course, we know that the potash represents the potassium carbonate. So we can write out a reaction, which is the same as the one that we wrote before. And likewise, the numbers that are in the problem can be organized along with the reaction that we've just written. But that's only half the problem, because the next part of the problem describes another reaction. It's this sentence right here. So now we have NaOH that's reacting with the excess acetic acid. Likewise, we have all the numbers, so we can put that information into this equation. So we've written out two reactions, and all of the numbers are represented from there. So if you're with me so far, that's great. And in fact, I'll say that this type of organizing information is a key step of problem solving, no matter what the type of problem is. Now, dealing specifically with the back titration, it's really just a matter of where do we begin? How do we go from this information to the answer that we're looking for? So remember, titrations are always about calculating moles. So you can pretty much almost start wherever you want. Say, if I have all the information I need to calculate moles, I might as well do it. So volume and a concentration, I'll be able to get moles of NaOH. Volume and a concentration, I can get moles over here. And don't go that place, right? 10.5 grams, that's not potassium carbonate, that's the ash. So we're not going to use that number. But I can go ahead and calculate numbers here. Now the other thing to realize is that the acetic acid was defined as being in excess. So unlike before, we could relate that directly to the potassium carbonate. We have to make use of the other equation. So where do we actually begin? We begin at the second equation. We're going to use this concentration and this volume to calculate number of moles and relate that to acetic acid. Then we work backwards to the original reaction and by relating that with the excess acetic acid, we'll actually be able to calculate the number of moles. Okay, so to follow along, what I've done is I've started over here. I've calculated the moles, and then because this is a one-to-one -one reaction, I'm relating directly to the moles over here. And off to the side, I've been able to calculate the number of moles of the acetic acid from this number over here. So I actually have moles of acetic acid in two places. We just have to understand what they mean. One of them is in excess, and the other one is the initial. So basically what we're doing is we're thinking about the amount that we started with, the initial, and we're taking away the excess. The difference has to be the stuff that's actually reacted. So once you've arrived at this step over here, you're basically back to like a direct titration. We've got the number of moles of acetic acid, which you can relate through the stoichiometry to get the moles of potassium carbonate. So let's do that here. And remember again, that you're not guessing. It's not two over one. You write down the units, so it's moles of acetic acid, and then we have a one to two ratio moles of potassium carbonate divided by moles of acetic acid. This ensures that we can cancel out the proper units. And to plug the numbers in and solve, we get the moles of potassium carbonate, where with one more step, we can convert that to the mass of potassium carbonate and use that number against the total mass of the ash to determine the weight percent. So back titrations, take a while to figure out. It's a matter of having all this information and seeing where it is. But I will remind you that titrations always boil down to three simple steps. And the steps are as follows. We have to have a balanced equation. So a reaction that describes the system that you're working with. You may be given that reaction as part of the problem. But then again, maybe it's just being given in words. NaOH reacts with HCl. Well, I can write out an equation for that. So from that balanced equation, you're going to use it to calculate the number of moles of your unknown. Of course, in doing that, you're going to take all the numbers that are given to you in the problem, or at least many of those numbers, organize it, and then use it to calculate moles. But you're always working on that step of find me the number of moles.
And then finally, every problem is going to be a little bit different, but you will always be calculating moles using a balanced equation. You're going to use that information to solve for whatever it is that you're missing. So here I've shown you that you solve for the weight percent, but maybe the, the question is done when it just says, what is the number of moles? Or what is the grams? Or what is the concentration? Whatever it's going to be, the moles that you've calculated in that first step is going to be used to solve the final answer.